Come on, make some noise if you're excited to be in God's house today. Amen. We are in this series, Unstoppable, where we're believing, and God's Word says, Job says, I know you can do anything, and your plans are unstoppable. We started this series a few weeks ago on our anniversary, 10-year anniversary. If you missed any of them, you can watch them online, but we started an initiative here at Discovery that's going to take us, advance us, propel us like a catalyst into the future called Unstoppable, and we really had three focuses of unstoppable. And I'll just recap them with you real quick if you miss it. The first focus was unstoppable church. And as we continue to see people come to Christ in like record, this year has been phenomenal, you guys. We've had already 329 baptisms already this year, which is a record of any other year already. And in salvations, there's more people that have got saved this year already than any other year. We're seeing youth and children come to Christ. Our youth ministry has over 200 kids joining them every week, you guys, on Wednesday. They're breaking through that barrier of 200. It's just been phenomenal, you guys. So God's church continues to grow, and our vision is to continue to provide for that. There is to continue to funnel resources into the ministries of the church. The next uh, focus is on mission, unstoppable mission. Our dream center, we're expanding the building, we're expanding our outreach. There's a lot of great things that we're doing in our inner city through outreach, but also abroad. Our Mexico missions and Uganda missions are taking off. You can find out more about that in our unstoppable booklet. But the third focus is unstoppable faith, where we're believing that we are going to expand right here on this property. It's our expansion plan to build a 1,250 seat worship center. Amen. And to have uh, this space turn into kids and just more space for all of our ministries and all the people that we're reaching through the gospel. And not just here at Southwest location, but our Northwest location as well. We're looking for a permanent facility for Northwest campus uh, already looking at that. So we're excited about what God is doing and how this unstoppable initiative is going to be a catalyst to take us into the future. There really are two goals. There's a primary goal and a secondary goal. Just as a way, by way of reminder, the primary goal of this initiative, you guys, is 100% of us that call Discovery Home would engage. We would be a part of this. We'd say, you know what? I'm going on the journey with my church family here at Discovery Church. We're going to be unstoppable, and I'm going to be a part of that. 100% of us on board. The secondary goal is actually raising the money, the funds, to advance the church, the mission, and our expansion of all of our campuses, which is 135 million dollars. That sounds like a lot. I get it. It is a lot. Praise God. But if, if we don't even do unstoppable, if we don't do the unstoppable initiative, you guys, the, we project that we would bring in, just through your tithes and offering, around eight million, probably a little over eight million dollars just in tithes and offering, you guys. To, and that does, that by the way takes care of all the outreach and missions and ministries of Discovery Church. The extra, the missions and expansion, that's why we get to 13.5. And that's why every single one of us we're going to be a part of this unstoppable, unstoppable initiative. You should have got this book. I just, if you didn't get a book, you guys, this booklet, grab it on your way out at the table because I was just talking to someone just this last week. He said, Pastor Jason, I didn't even know that there was a guide in here that like had daily prayers and stuff. There's so much content in here. I was like, yeah, I've been telling you for three weeks. There's like, you go through this thing like, like this is, the, 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 we, like the team put a lot of time into like writing out, writing out prayers and discussion questions to help you take a journey, this unstoppable journey. So grab the book on your way out. Use that in your own Bible studies and in your small groups. You also got one of these unstoppable commitment cards and if you didn't, they're out there inside uh, of our Unstoppable Center in, in the back. Uh, on the back of this card, you guys, I just I want you to see this giving chart. For us to reach our goal, you guys, it is going to take gifts at all levels from all people. There is a place on this chart for everyone at our church. Take a look at this chart, and I want you to see where you would put yourself. Would you ask God, though, to, to take you and move you a little bit further up the chart? Okay, and I'm believing that some of you can actually be on those top lines of that chart in Jesus' name. Amen, somebody? Okay, so how do you fill out this card, though? A lot of people were asking, okay, this is a little confusing. There's a lot of box. So let me help you out, like, in filling out this card. By the way, this will be, it's not today. I'll talk to you about that. But how do you fill out this commitment card? If you're part of the Discovery family, what does all this mean? Let me walk it through with you guys, okay? That first box, it says, what 
what would we normally give in a year? So whatever your normal tithes and offerings would be, you'd put that in that first box. Whatever that is, you'd say, okay, we give this much every, every week or every month or whatever. And some of you, maybe there's not even anything in that box because you don't normally give, and that's okay. It'd be like, okay, there's nothing in that box. I would normally give nothing. But then that second box says, what is my expanded annual generosity for Unstoppable? What am I going to give to advance the mission and expansion of the church through the Unstoppable Initiative? You'll put that amount that you guys pray about, your family prays about, in that second line. Then what you'll do, the third line, the third step, is to add both of those things up. What is your new annual giving amount? And then what you'll do on the fourth line is you times it by two because this is a two-year journey that we're taking. Two years to reach the goal, to expand the church, and to accomplish the mission. Then there's that line that we've talked about, I've shared with you guys a couple of times, of shared resources. Any of your other gifts, like stocks or or collectibles or whatever it is you say you know what i'm gonna give beyond the the financial stuff and i can give some other stuff as well you put that there and then you total that up on that last line of your two-year total commitment don't forget to fill in all your information on the bottom okay the you'll fill that out between now and october 8th october 8th is commitment sunday what i want you to do is just be praying go on the journey with us and pray about what god would have you do and where you fit on that giving chart. And between now and then, it's just pray. And there's no arm twisting here. I believe God will take care of his church. Jesus said, I will build my church. So I don't need to, no one needs to twist your arm. I'm inviting you to go on a journey with me to believe God, to trust God, to leave a legacy with me and with your church. And you pray about that and what that looks like for you. But ain't nobody twisting your arm. You do what God tells you to do in prayer. Can I get an amen, you guys? Okay. Go ahead and put that down for a moment. Let me jump in here to week number three of our Unstoppable series. Okay, we know God's Word says His plans are unstoppable, but His plans don't always roll out the way we would like. How many of you know what I'm talking about, okay? Not in our timetable, not in the way. Life will present you with obstacles, with challenges, barriers, and closed doors. But just because the door is closed doesn't mean it's time to quit. Jesus said, keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking, and the door will be open to you. Some of you get a closed door and you stop. God wants you to sometimes keep knocking on that door. Are you hearing me? Colossians, I love this verse. Some of you need to like put this verse somewhere, memorize this verse, write it down somewhere. Colossians chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, in the message paraphrase, says it like this. We pray that you'll have the strength to stick it out. Over the long haul, man, not to give up too soon, man, but to stick it out over the long haul. Not the grim strength of gritting your teeth, but look what he says, but the glory strength God gives. Oh, that's how how you be unstoppable. You need some glory strength that God gives. What is glory strength? It's it's in the suffering and the pain. How will you respond? You see, the glory strength pushes you through when you can't push yourself anymore, when you want to quit. It's the strength that endures the unendurable and spills over into joy. Thanking the Father who makes us strong. Let me say that again. Who makes us strong to take part in everything bright and beautiful that he has for us. Amen. Today, I'm talking to every person who has, is, or will entertain the idea of quitting. That quitting would be easier, that you've been gritting your teeth and getting by. And you don't even know, some of you don't know how much longer you can make it or take it. And as you look at your situation, you can almost convince yourself that all the signs are pointing towards you quitting. Maybe God's not in it. Maybe this is the end. Maybe our marriage ain't going to work. Maybe the job isn't for me. Maybe that calling isn't for me. Maybe I didn't really hear from God. It's pointing. It looks like it's pointing that you should quit. You should give up. This isn't going to work and it never will work. Galatians chapter 6 verse 9 says this, let us not become weary in doing good for at the proper time, somebody say proper time, well, that's God's time. At the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we, say it out loud, if we do not give up. That's right. Here's, here's the word I got for you today. I want you to hold on to it. Don't give up. Don't give up. Life will knock you on the ground. 
It'll knock you on your back. And I don't blame you for that. No one blames you for that. That's part of life. But if you come back one week later and you're still on the ground, that's your fault. There's nothing you can do about the knockdowns in life. But getting back up has everything to do with you. God, I make a covenant with your word. I'm not going to be defeated. I'm not going to quit. I'm, I'm going to get back up when life knocks me down. All throughout the scriptures, you see the stories of unstoppable faith where people did not give up and reap the harvest because of it. Let me just give you a few examples. Joseph was thrown out of his family and into prison and into a pit. David is chased out of the kingdom. Elijah has a mental breakdown. Paul is sentenced to prison. Every Every person who reaped the harvest had to endure the pain of the process. Don't give up on the harvest. Don't give up on the breakthrough. Don't give up on your marriage. Don't give up on your calling. Don't give up on your dream. Don't give up on your kids for in the proper time. That word in the Greek proper time is kairos. Kairos. That's what it, the Greek word for that which your New Testament was written in Greek. It means a specific God appointed time, season, our moment. Here's what a Kairos moment is. A Kairos moment is a time made up of three elements. Here's what it is. It's a moment of maximum opportunity. It's a moment when change is possible, and it's an exquisite syncretistic moment when all things come together and align for God's good. Okay, this is a Kairos moment, but here's the question and the tension that we have to deal with today. What do you do when you've been believing? You've been gritting your teeth. You've been trying and praying and doing the right things, and your world gets shaken up. The very foundation that you were trusting on becomes uncertain, and things begin to shake. Let me give you some principles today to live an unstoppable life. Number one, don't be surprised by adversity. Don't be surprised. When adversity comes, you need to understand that's a normal part of life. God's not picking on you. People aren't picking on you. Can you just hear that, please? People aren't picking on you. They pick on everybody. You ain't special. Don't be surprised when you face adversity. And in the birthing of your dreams, adversity acts as the contraction that pushes your dreams into reality. Here's what the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. Dear friends, don't be surprised about the fiery trials that have come among you to test you. These are not strange happenings. These, these aren't strange. Don't act like they're strange. He's saying problems are a normal part of life in this broken world. You don't live in heaven. And heaven is perfect. And heaven is not broken. Here, everything's broken. Everybody is broken. Every, everything is broken. This world is broken. The weather is broken. Our, 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 our bodies are broken. Everything is broken in this world. And heaven is perfect. Economy is broken. Everything. Our minds are broken. There's going to be sufferings. There's going to be trials. Don't be surprised by it. Jesus said it like this in John 16, 33. In this world, you will experience difficulties, but take heart. I have conquered the world. I've told you this so that in trusting me, you will be unshakable and deeply at peace. See, Jesus warned us that adversity was going to be a part of life. Don't let it blow you away. Don't be surprised. Don't be shocked. you got to be uh, unshakable and unstoppable. And he says, I'm telling you this so you don't cave in when the problem comes, when the adversity comes, when, it, when your world starts to get shaken up. Spiritual maturity, you know, is measured by the time it takes to move from problem to panic to pain to prayer. How long does it take you to get to the place of prayer? That's what spiritual maturity is measured by. You know what the typical response, though, is when you go through crisis? The typical response when you and I go through crisis is trying to find someone to blame. Whose fault is it? And as long as you're fixing the blame, you're not fixing the problem. Instead of asking whose fault it is, you need to ask me, what should I do? Okay, there are four primary sources to your problems. Four primary sources. Let me give them to you. Number one is you. You, you are the primary source to your problems. I am my biggest problem. I cause myself more pain, more heartache from my dumb decisions. The second source of problems in our life is the world around us. The world, the nature within you, the world around you wants to pull you down to their morals, their standards, their integrity. The third source of problems, though, of course, is Satan. The devil is real, and he is scheming to steal, kill, and destroy, okay? But the one I want to talk to you about today is this fourth source of problems, and that is God. Yeah, God. 
is a source of some of the very problems that you're dealing with. Some of the problems and pressures and difficulties you have in life actually come from God. God will sometimes bring tests and trials into your life for very good reasons, and that's why I want to cover this in detail today, because that's one that's unexpected that we don't realize. Here's the second step based on that. Anytime that you're going through trials and you feel like giving up, number two, look for ways God might use it for good. It doesn't really matter where the problem comes from because God will use every problem, no matter where it came from, for his good. You mean even my dumb decisions, even the sin that I commit? Absolutely. If you surrender to God and you align to his purpose, he'll use all that stuff for his good, your good and his glory. All of it. So regardless of the source that's got you all like shaken up, you lost your job, you, you, can't, you, you can't get married, I want this and it didn't happen, I have this dream and, and, and I hit a barrier, regardless of whatever is shaking you up, God wants to use it for good. The source isn't nearly as important as your response. Romans chapter 8, 28 says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. Now, there are some reasons why God will, will produce testing and trials and problems and just shake things up in your life. And when he does, it's always for your good. But you won't see the good if you quit, if you stop. So let me show you some reasons why if today you've been gritting your teeth and you're, you're, you're feeling like things are getting shaken up in your life, let me tell you like why God might be doing that for actually your good. Write these down. See, God uses problems to inspect me. What I mean by that is God brings a problem in your life to reveal the motivation of your life. You see, that motivation is out of alignment. Our character or a thought, an emotion, a motive. Some people say that, that people are like tea bags. You know, you don't know what's inside of them until they, you dip it in hot water. God will use problems to inspect you, to show you what's wrong, what's out of whack in your life. You've got a fear. You've got a wrong motivation. You've got a value, a belief, a thought process, a misperception. There's a lie that you're believing. God uses problems to inspect you. But of course, God already knows what's in your heart. He doesn't bring the trials and the problems in your life. For him, he actually brings the trials and problems in your life for you to know what's in your heart because you're deceiving yourself. So he'll bring it to inspect us and bring revelation to us. Jeremiah 17, 10 says, I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind. Now listen, the why is always more important to what for God? The what you do is not nearly as important as the why you do it. There's a lot of things in your life that God's like, sure, you can do that. Go ahead. You want to do that with your life? Go. Yeah, that's fine. I'm okay with that. But I'm more interested in why you want to do that. Like he's more interested in the why you're doing then you, what are you doing? He, he searches the heart and examines the mind to reward each person according to their conduct, according to what their deeds deserve. God inspects us because he's much more interested in our integrity than our image. The image is the, the, what everybody else sees, but, but integrity is the inner you. See, have you ever thought about the fact why it took the Israelites 40 years to get across the desert from Egypt where they had been set free as slaves. Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought about that? How God just like took them on this journey and it took them so long, like 40 years, you guys. You can walk, I don't know if you understand this, but you can walk across the Sinai, the desert, and get to where they were going in a matter of a couple months easily, but it took them 40 years to walk across the desert. 40 years, why did it take them? 40 years. To walk around. Why is it? Why is this prolonged? The seasons of our life prolonged. The seasons of testing and trials. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2 actually tells us God led you on purpose all the way in the desert these 40 years. Why, God? To humble you and to test you. To humble you. He took you on that long route. He took you through seasons of desert, of dryness, of wilderness to humble you, to test you in order to know what is in your heart, whether or not you keep his commands. The Bible says that while they were in the desert, God kept testing them. He, and then when they would fail the test, he'd say, all right, another lap around the desert. And they failed the test. All right, take another lap around the desert. 
And by the way, when God takes you through your desert experience, through your dry seasons, through your wilderness, through your waiting, you see the promised land, you have a vision of it, it's right there, and you feel like you're just circling. Why is God doing that? The desert isn't punishment. It's preparation for the promise. That's what it is. God is testing you. What matters in your maturity spiritually is not how high you can jump when you feel God in worship experiences. The test is how faithful you walk when you don't feel God the rest of the week. When you're going, when you don't feel God, when you're in the desert, in the dryness, where you don't have the emotion, in that dry period, in the wilderness, God says, will you trust me there? Will you obey me there? He's doing it, listen, he does it to inspect us. That's why God will bring some trials, while God brings some problems into your life. Some of the problems are actually from God. Some of your wandering and, 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 and dry periods are actually from God. He wants to reveal something inside of you. Are you guys receiving this today? Here's, here's, the second, here's the second thing. God uses problems to correct me. Not only to inspect me, but to correct me. Here's an important verse, you guys. Hebrews chapter 12, very important verse. God corrects all of his children. And if he doesn't correct you, then you don't really belong to him. So if you can sin and get, get, if you can sin and get away with it, then you should probably really doubt, am I in the family of God? God corrects his children, and if he doesn't correct you, then you don't really belong to him. God corrects us for our own good because he wants us to be holy as he is. It, it's never fun to be corrected. How many of you agree with that part of the Bible right there, right? It's not fun to be corrected. In fact, at the time, it is always painful. But if we learn to obey by being corrected, we will do right and live at peace. I mean, did you benefit from correction growing up? Anyone benefit from correction? Of course you did. That's how you learn to walk and talk and, and eat and bathe and read and all that stuff. Everything else, you know, you learn because somebody cared enough to correct you. A parent who doesn't correct their children doesn't love their children. They love themselves more. Are you hearing me, parents? You love yourself more than you're loving your kids. You're prioritizing what they think about you and how they feel about you than their health and their future. I don't know who that was for, okay? But you, sometimes the only way to learn, though, that sometimes the only way to train is through the pain. The next verse, Hebrews chapter 12, an extremely important verse for your life. When God spoke the Ten Commandments and Moses chiseled them into the tablets up there on Mount Sinai, when he, when he spoke the Bible, says he spoke so loud that the people down in the valley could hear him. Look what it says in Hebrews 12. When God spoke from Mount Sinai, his voice shook the earth. But now he says, I will not only shake the earth, but the heavens too. What does that mean? By this, he means that he will sift out everything without a solid foundation. Talking about your life right there. So that only the unshakable things will be left. See, sometimes you're going through the fire. You're going through the problem. You're going through the, the difficulty. You're going through a sifting because God is trying to shake things off of you that don't belong on you. Sometimes God uses problems to shake things up, to inspect me. Sometimes it's to correct me. God uses problems, write this down, to direct me. This is for direction. God wants to point us in a new direction. And sometimes he uses the problem, the trial, the testing. God wants to guide us on a different path. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 9 says, A person may plan his own journey, but the Lord directs his steps. You know how God often directs your steps? Problems. Yeah, that's how God directs your step a lot of times. Have you ever noticed how a problem often changes your plans? I don't know, has anybody ever had that happen in your life? Your problems change your plans. What is God doing? What, why? He's redirecting you. That's what he's doing. He inspects you, he corrects you, and he directs you when things are flying off the wall. Pain is a powerful motivation to change. We often don't change when we see the light. We change when we feel the heat. Proverbs 20, verse 30 says, sometimes it takes a painful experience to make us change our ways. How many of you know what it's that, thought, that one's talking about, right? Okay. Every one of us give a testimony right now about that. Sometimes God has to light a fire under you so you can get uneasy. So you can get a little bit uncomfortable. We rarely think about the direction of our life when, when everything's going good. When it's going good, you're in easy mode. You're in coast mode. You're in like neutral, just going through. You're not thinking about what direction God wants you to. What, what, you're not thinking about none of that stuff. But, some, but sometimes God will put a wrench in it 
to get you thinking about where you're going and what you're doing and why you're going there, to redirect you. You know, you're going good. You're in cruise control. Then all of a sudden, traffic jam, accident. Why did God do that? Because he wants to get your attention. He wants to redirect you. And God gets our attention many times to change our direction. Here's a good question we should be asking ourselves. What problem in your life are you pretending isn't a problem? What's the big elephant in your life, in your marriage, in your relationship that you say, ah, oh, it's not a problem. We postpone those difficult decisions. We, we put it off. The very reason why there's pain, there's a pressure point, is because God's trying to get your attention. He's trying to redirect you. There's something in your values, in your beliefs, in your relationship. There's, the reason why there's pain there is because God is trying to show you something's out of alignment here. He's trying to redirect your life. God uses problems to direct me. Write this down. God uses even problems to protect me. I don't know if you ever thought about that. Do you know that sometimes pain protects you from something worse? That you're going through a problem, but it's actually preventing you from a bigger problem. It's keeping you from greater harm. You might have wanted a certain job or a certain business, and it didn't happen, and God was protecting you because he knew that there was a relationship there that was going to mess you up. And he kept you out of that situation. Sometimes the, the problem is a blessing, not a curse. It's a blessing in disguise. Job chapter 36, verse 16 says, God has led you away from danger, giving you freedom. Remember the story of Joseph in the Bible. Perfect example of this. He has a vision. One day he's going to be a great leader. And literally for the first 40 years of his life, everything went wrong. He was betrayed by his brothers, sold into slavery, taken down to Egypt. You know, gets his job as a slave in a boss's home, but the wife of the boss is attracted to him. She comes on to him, offers himself. He refuses. He has integrity. And, and he gets thrown into jail anyway. And then in that place, and only in that place, was he in position to know the person who has the ear of Pharaoh, and actually through the circumstances of the prison in his entire life, led, leads him to stand before Pharaoh and interpret a dream. You don't know. Sometimes God is pro he's protecting you with a problem in your life. And then when it was all over, Joseph said to his brothers who betrayed him in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. When I was thrown in the pit, when you threw me out of the family, when I was, when I was uh, accused of something I didn't do, when my, my character was attacked, when they gossiped about me, when they lied about me, you might have intended that for harm, but God intended the pain to produce good. It was good. It was for my own protection. You can't grow up on easy street. You want the product without the process, but there's no maturity without growing pains. And the very thing that discourages you is the very thing that God uses to develop you. It's, it's that pain. It's that problem. And you're, you wish it wasn't there, but that's what God's using to develop your faith. And here's the reward coming. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10, it says, And the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while. I wish, you know, there's some, some verses I just weren't, wish weren't there. You know what I mean? I wish it wasn't like, I wish I didn't have to. Why not just give me the prize, right? We want, we want the prize, not the process. We, we, want, we, want, we want the development, but not the discouragement, okay? But, but God says, no, that's not how it works. I got I to gotta prepare you for it. I got to take you through a preparation period for the promise I want to give you. You got you to go through character preparation, maturity preparation, faith preparation. Because after you suffer for a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. Why? Because you're not taking your car or your car or your cash or your career or your clothes to heaven. You're taking your character. God is not interested in making your life easy on earth. He's, make, he's interested in growing your character. So knowing that God can even use the bad things in my life to inspect me, to direct me, to correct me, and even to perfect me, what should be my response then to my problems? As I'm, as I'm like trying and striving and praying and I, things are getting shaken up and this ain't going right and this ain't going right and it's just not we, when God what should be our response knowing that God is actually using all those things to correct direct protect and perfect why what should be our response here's what we got to ultimately do to be unstoppable especially when our world is shaken up and that is trust God 
for what I don't understand. I have to trust God for what I don't understand. See, when there's a problem in my life and I go, this one doesn't make sense. I, I don't get it, God. I don't see the perfection here. I don't, I, don't, I don't see the inspection here. I don't see the correction here. I don't see the protection here. I don't see how this is doing anything good. I just don't get how in the world this can be any of your plan for my life. This problem just doesn't make sense. Then I trust God for what I don't understand, knowing He is good. See, faith is facing your future without knowing what. Faith is following God's leading without knowing where. Faith is waiting on God's timing without knowing when. And faith is expecting a miracle without knowing how. It's trusting God, even when I don't understand. Proverbs chapter 20, 24. Since the Lord is directing our steps. If that's, if that's what we believe, if that's true, if that's His word, if that's, if since, since that's true, the Lord's directing our steps. He's in control. He's using it. Why do I try to understand everything that happens along the way? If he's in control, if he's directing my, my steps, if he has my plan, if, if he's going to use it ultimately for my, well, why, why would I try to understand everything that happens? Some of us need to memorize this and tattoo it on our arm or something. And you don't believe in tattoo, write it in ink or something like that, Okay. If you're ever going to get a tattoo, this will be the verse right here, okay? Since the Lord is directing our steps, why try to understand everything that happens along the way? It's foolish. Trying to understand God's ways is like trying to under, understand the galaxy. This ever-expanding thing that you just like, it's just, you cannot, your mind cannot wrap around God's plans. He is infinitely bigger and beyond. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. So far, the heavens are from the earth or His ways from our ways. And His thoughts from our thoughts. There's no way. And we just, we just discourage ourselves because we try to understand what God is doing. So, so when you're going through the problem and you're going through the trial and things get shaken up and you don't, it doesn't make sense, I don't see how this could be working, that right there is where you need to choose to trust God for the thing that you can't understand. Proverbs 3 says, trust the Lord with all your heart. It doesn't say intellect, by the way. It says heart. Trust the Lord with all your heart. Don't depend on your own understanding. Don't depend on what you can work out in your mind and how God is doing. Oh, I see what he's doing. This is, this is what. No, no, no. Don't depend on your own understanding. Honor the Lord in everything you do and he will give you success. And I want you to have God's success. Not this world's success. I mean, if that comes with it, great. But I want you to have the God kind of success. As your pastor, that's my goal. That's my job. My role to help you succeed in Christ. I want you to be a success. I want you to live unstoppable. And, and, and there's a tension with that. Because when problems and doors close, what do you do? Are you going to quit? Are you going to give up? Are you going to stop? Or are you going to realize that God's in control? And I don't need to understand it. I don't need to understand it. I just need to be faithful. Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.